Hi students, today we're going to turn to another wing of the Reformation and that's the wing of Calvinism. Uh, we see how Luther and the uh, radical Protestants like Zwingli provided a lot of the emotional spark for the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but John Calvin and his intellectual legacy is extremely important for providing the theoretical uh, background and backup for uh, these uh, ideas and basically establishing Protestantism as a system of Christianity beyond a sort of proto-German nationalism. So we begin with Calvin's background. Calvin's mother died when he was young. He was born in France in 1509, uh, and he studied theology. His father was an attorney for a bishop, and that enabled him to provide Calvin with a substantial education. Calvin was renowned for his ability uh, to debate and considered even becoming a priest at one point uh, before discovering a love for the law and the certainty that it provided. Uh, so this is kind of interesting where um, a lot of the other Renaissance thinkers uh, that we've looked at so far uh, found were uh, also despised uh, the law, where Luther was intended to be a lawyer by his father, but uh, rejected law. We find that Calvin finds a, a great love for the law and the certainty that it provides. He also discovers an interest in and a love for the study of the language of Greek. So here we find um, another legacy of the Renaissance, the study of language, something that appeals to the young John Calvin as well. He rejects the medieval philosophy of education known as scholasticism that we've talked about a couple of times in this class already. For him, scholasticism, the use of logic to reason to conclusions, does not provide the same certainty that the law provided in the physical realm and the Bible provided in the spiritual realm. And it's true that one of uh, Calvin's teachers was a student of William of Ockham, who was a great pioneer of nominalism. And so here we have that nominalism thread again. The uneasiness about suggesting that one can come to, uh, can reason to knowledge about God, uh, rather than coming to knowledge about God simply through faith. Now, Calvin has told us relatively little of his emotions uh, and his spiritual journey during this period. Unlike Luther, where we know he's going through a spiritual crisis at this time, Calvin doesn't tell us that. We know he returns to Paris uh, to complete a degree in humanism in 1533. Uh, we know that at some point in this time, 10, 15 years, after the 95 Theses, he would have been influenced uh, by Luther. We know that he admired Luther. And uh, what we do know is that at some point, he had some kind of conversion experience where he felt called to reform the practice of Christianity in this society. And he tells us he was mired in the fear that the Roman church had sought to inculcate in its believers. In or, and basically this fear that he's referring to is a similar fear to the fear that Luther talks about. Roman church had, was controlling people through fear uh, that they would go to hell if they did not perform good works or if they did not, um, or if they did not receive the sacraments, sacraments of the church. Luther and Calvin are arguing that's not really what the gospel and the Bible is about at all. They're arguing that these, uh, it's faith uh, that saves human beings, the acts of sinful human beings. Uh, they can't gain and earn salvation for themselves. And to them, that seems to be what Catholics are arguing. And so Calvin's suddenly interested in uh, religion and in the church and in reforming the church. But he, unlike Luther and Zwingli, never uh, was ordained, uh, never received the formation of priest. In 1534, he separates himself from the church. Now, up until this point, studying at a university was typically some kind of preparation for joining the clergy. And so you received some kind of stipend from some sort of church that helped fund your studies. And so Calvin removes himself from that so that he doesn't have that kind of tie that's bearing on him. And uh, he also separates himself more directly from the church as a result of the cop affair. 
Now, one of Calvin's friends at the University of Paris named Nicolas Cop was elected chancellor of the university. And in his opening sermon, he cited Erasmus and a number of other humanists, but he also cited Luther. He also quoted Luther and he compared the persecution of the poor with the way that Catholics were persecuting reformers and suggested that the sacraments were largely symbolic. This speech causes quite a stir. You've got the rector of one of the most important Catholic universities in the world who is saying some things that sound very sympathetic to Luther and those who are rebelling against the church. So this uh, speech is denounced as heretical and cop flees to Switzerland. Flees to Switzerland because that's where there's already been a foundation laid for practicing Protestant Christianity by Zwingli. And so Calvin is going to, uh, in the end, flee with him. Uh, before he does, though, he publishes his most famous work called The Institutes. And uh, these were designed as uh, catechisms to teach Protestant Christianity to those who leaned in favor of the Reformation. And uh, Calvin is going to edit and revise uh, this work a number of times so that the final work uh, in 1559 is over 1500 pages long. It's more of a training manual for ministers and leaders of the Protestant church than it is for the laity. There are six chapters on the law, creed, Lord's Prayer, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and arguments against any other sacraments promoted by the Roman Catholic Church it's in favor of Christian liberty. And so this book was widely published and translated, uh, published first in Latin, but then in English, French, Italian, Dutch, Czech, Spanish, Hungarian, all these different languages. And so this is one way that we can see already that Calvin is envisioning a wider canvas for Protestant Christianity, He's envisioning that this is a set of beliefs that's not just going to be accepted in Germany as a way of resisting efforts by the papacy to collect indulgences, but this is going to be uh, a separate church and a se separate system of theology. Now, Calvin had opened the institutes with a plea to the French king. Remember, he's in Paris at the time in the Kingdom of France, the Catholic kingdom with a Catholic king. And Calvin asks the French king of the time, who's Francis I, he asks him to give Protestants a fair hearing. He claims that the teachings that he's arguing are not new, they're not heretical, they're simply a return to a simpler faith focused on the scriptures and the church fathers. But Francis I showed no interest in relenting in his persecution of Protestants. And so because of this, uh, Calvin is going to be forced to flee to Switzerland. That's because at this time, France is a far more unified kingdom than the Holy Roman Empire is. So it's not as though you can have a local French duke who says, I'm going to defy the king and I'm going to allow Calvin to stay in my territories and preach Protestant Christianity. They know that the king can uh, order them uh, in, in these different ways. And so uh, Calvin is going to be forced to flee. Uh, Calvin and lots of other French Protestants are forced to flee from France and flee to Switzerland. Calvin is on his way to Zurich, which was the center, had been the center of Zwingli's uh, Reformation. And he comes to uh, Geneva and intends to only spend a night there. But one of the lead, but by now there's a group of French Protestant refugees in Geneva and their leader, William Farrell, I've shown you an image of him here, he convinces Calvin to stay. They ask him to stay and lead them. They've read his institutes. They respect the way he's presenting uh, he's uh, presenting their uh, view of Christianity. And Calvin initially says, I don't want to be a leader of this community. I'm a scholar. I want to research. I want to write books. I don't want to be an administrator. And uh, Farrell accuses Calvin of being selfish. He says, if you really care about God, you will stay and you will care for these people. If you go on and try and just live your scholarly life in a cave, God will curse uh, your scholarship. Calvin is convinced by this and he remains. Now, Geneva, like the rest of Switzerland, was attempting to achieve independence. And so these are similar political dynamics that had supported Luther and Zwingli. 
different regions of the Holy Roman Empire wanted to be more independent of the emperors. Switzerland wanted to be more independent from France. Embracing a different religion um, or a different form of Christianity was a way to encourage these ideas of independence. And we see this in Geneva as well. Geneva declared itself to be an independent town in 1527 with its independent uh, body. So you have a town council of about 200 people and a little council of about 25 that held executive power. Beginning in 1533, Protestant missionaries start to come to Geneva from France and from Zurich, and they begin to achieve a significant following, and led by William Farrell, who gains the support of the little council. And so beginning in 1535, Catholicism is outlawed in the city of Zurich. It means that the Catholic mass was banned, Catholic clergy was forced to convert or to flee, and monasteries Convents were destroyed, papal authority was rejected. So this was the mandate for Protestantism that Farrell and his colleagues were trying to take up when uh, Calvin arrived. And so basically what Farrell says to him is these people are open to the ideas of the Reformation, but they need a leader. We have this opportunity to implement our ideas here. Now, what we often see in religion and politics is that it's much easier to complain and to show the problems in ideas than to implement ideas yourself. And this is something that Calvin and Farrell find very quickly. Uh, so they begin to uh, implement, attempt to implement the reform. And uh, their first efforts are a failure. They try and put political power in the hands of the clergy, they basically try and set up a theocracy. And the city's population uh, rejects the settlement. And more than that, the city council, which still holds political power, uh, drives them out of the city. They refuse to give up political control to Farrell and Calvin. And uh, this is an important lesson uh, for Calvin and Farrell. Uh, when you remove the institutional Catholic Church, you make local politicians much more powerful. The reformers who are trying to implement a new form of Protestant Christianity are going to be forced to work with these local political rulers. And so Calvin has to leave Geneva and he becomes a pastor in the city of Strasbourg. We've spoken about how Strasbourg is in this corridor beginning in Switzerland and stretching up to Holland where we see the most radical forms of Protestantism finding acceptance. And Calvin becomes a pastor uh, in the city of Strasbourg, which had been the city of uh, Melchior Hoffman, the apocalyptic preacher who uh, inspired the Munster Rebellion who we, that we talked about last week. Strasbourg was an independent imperial city, so it's not in the Kingdom of France, can't be persecuted by the king, it's in the Holy Roman Empire, but it's so far away that it has, uh, it has a lot of freedom and a lot of independence. And here, uh, it's uh, at the center of trade and a center of new ideas. Uh, it's a much more fluid society, it's a much less conservative society, it's much more open to the new ideas that Calvin is promoting. And here is where Calvin learns to integrate religious and political authority. He also meets many other reformers from across Europe. Many of these people become his lifelong friends and correspondents. And these experiences helped him, again, to envision a form of Protestant Christianity that wasn't restricted to a particular region, but uh, that people across Europe could adopt and believe. It was also in Strasbourg that Calvin married. He mar married a widow named Idolette, who became his faithful companion and who brought a family atmosphere uh, to his household. He wrote new commentaries on the Bible, and these increased his prominence among, uh, among different Protestant communities uh, who recognized him as a scholar from uh, the institutes. And so he's establishing himself as an intellectual leader of Protestantism at this early point in his career. 